access to justice has been one of the Justice Committee's priorities, particularly in light of the report of the Access to Justice Review team published in August 2011. The Committee was briefed by the Access to Justice Review team on the recommendations made in the report, and the Justice Minister also attended Committee meetings to give his response to the review. The Committee explored a wide range of issues um, during these briefings, such as addressing legal aid expenditure, including financial eligibility, scope and fees, a public defender service, alternative dispute resolution to facilitate early resolution of disputes, the role of the advice and voluntary sector in providing advice and meeting uh, legal need, and structures for the delivery of legal aid, and in order to support the committee's consideration of, of the issues and the justice, access to justice review, a number of re uh, research papers were commissioned from RAISE on these issues, and these are actually available on the committee's website and on RAISE's website, on the Northern Ireland Assembly website. The, the committee has considered departmental policy proposals, including consultation with civil legal aid remuneration, reform of financial eligibility in civil and criminal legal aid cases, alternative methods of funding money damages cases and reform of publicly funded legal representation in civil and family law cases. And we've heard evidence from representatives of the legal profession in the last few months on proposals on publicly funded legal representation in civil and family law cases. And I know the committee will continue to monitor progress in the implementation of the re review's recommendations. The Justice Committee has also considered the issue of tribunal reform Tribunals are an important feature in administrative law in Northern Ireland and can often deal with vulnerable, vulnerable or disadvantaged groups, such as those with mental health issues, welfare matters and special education needs and disability. An effective and efficient tribunal system is vital to ensure access to justice. And the committee was briefed by departmental officials on consultation proposals on the future administration and structure of tribunals earlier this year. And during these briefings, the committee explored issues such as the role of the Lord Chief Justice in a proposed new structure, the re removal of ministerial involvement in appointments, early dispute resolution, and the use of court venues for tribunals, amongst other issues. And they, will, they looked at the issue of tribunals again in July when they considered the Department of Justice summary report and responses received in relation to the consultation. And they will continue to keep a close eye on developments in that area, particularly when proposals on the way forward are available. And the committee also commissioned research from raising and tribunal structures in other jurisdictions, comparable jurisdictions, particularly those in common law um, countries. Um, given the vital importance of ensuring access to justice, the committee and ourselves welcome the presentation and the research by Gronny McKeever from the University of Ulster. And we congratulate you on your recent promotion to readership. Um, Gronny will present her findings on access to justice through better decision making. The presentation will review the empirical research evidence which highlights the barriers that individuals face in disputing administrative decisions made by government agencies, the role of advice in helping users overcome these barriers, and the access to justice issues that arise from this. And Grani will also examine the steps that initial decision makers and governments can take individually and systematically to improve access to justice, from the focus on improving the quality of initial decisions to developing mechanisms to support individuals throughout the dispute resolution process. So, Gron, you're very, very welcome. We look forward to hearing what you have to say in your presentation. Fiona, thank you very much for the invitation and i um, delighted to be here. Um, as the title suggests and as Fiona has laid out, uh, the presentation is about uh, looking at decision making as a way to improve access to justice. And it's about decision making primarily um, by government agencies that deal with administrative issues, but it's not exclusively related to that. Um, and so I'm, I want to look at uh, decision making as a start to end process rather than as just a, at one particular point within that process. Uh, we know that the number of disputes that are taken against administrative decisions have increased over recent years. The Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunals Service annual report uh, indicates that in the last 12 months there has been a 43% increase in tribunal cases. Uh, and the variation across tribunal cases is laid out very helpfully in that report. And we see some uh, caseloads increasing and some decreasing. In um, the valuation tribunals, for example, it's the largest percentage increase. There's a 127% increase over the last 12 months, which is about, uh, if memory serves, about 50 cases or so that uh, have increased uh, over the previous 12 months. Uh, and that's attributed to new legislation relating to empty homes and unfinished properties. The biggest number of cases, the largest volume of, of caseload, uh, is in the appeal service which sees a 51% increase in the last 12 months 
and that's attributable to uh, the migration, primarily the migration of individuals from incapacity benefit to employment and support allowance. So again, there's a very specific reason to indicate why that increase exists there, uh, and it's attributable to uh, legislative change. There are other examples of increases and decreases which are less obviously explained. Uh, the Special Education Needs and Disability Tribunal, for example, has seen an increase of 26% in its caseload over the last 12 months with no obvious explanation, at least not obvious to me, uh, as to why that increase has happened. So it's clear that increases can uh, be predictable uh, so that when new legislation comes in we would anticipate an increase in caseload, but there are also unpredictable elements uh, of decision making that will lead to uh, increased numbers of appeals, which means that, that the issue of uh, appeals is, is going to be critical uh, regardless of what the, the legislative mechanism is and whether it's constant or whether it's changing. The tribunals that are supported administratively by the Department of Justice really represent the majority of tribunals in Northern Ireland, with the notable exception of industrial and fair employment tribunals, which are still within the uh, Department of Employment and Learning and, and uh, uh, run through the Office of Industrial and Fair Employment Tribunals. So the uh, issue of tribunal appeals here, uh, tribunal claims more, more accurately, has seen a different pattern. Over the last few years, there's been a decrease in the number of claims that have been received. In the last 12 months, the annual report of Outfit shows a 3% decrease in claims. Um, but within that statistic, again, there are interesting uh, issues that arise. So we see a reduction of claims to the Fair Employment Tribunal, but an increase uh, in the claims to the Industrial Tribunal, partly because Industrial Tribunal claims can be counted uh, perhaps more than once in multiple claims. Um, but within the annual report, there's a clear emphasis that the uh, issue of recession and unfair dismissal remain a live issue and remain a, 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 a cause to generate uh, high numbers of claims. So again, the, the context in which uh, claims operate is going to, uh, and, and appeals operate will be important um, and indicate why certain increases and decreases arise, but increases uh, are going to be uh, particularly problematic for uh, the Department of Justice where those tribunals are administratively, administratively supported by DOJ. The increase in the number of appeals is an indication of where uh, there's an in increase in disputes that are taken against administrative decisions, but clearly tribunal statistics just represent the, the last point in that process uh, and are not indicative of all of the disputes that arise because not all cases uh, will end up in a tribunal and in fact not all cases will be disputed to begin with. There will be decisions that individuals disagree with that are not challenged. So tribunal statistics show us the trajectory, but they don't show us the entire picture. And certainly the research evidence that, uh, is, that looks at the experiences of tribunal users indicates very clearly that it's not possible to isolate the tribunal experience as the part that you must look at. That for individuals, the tribunal experience is not an isolated part of their dispute. It just is another component of where their dispute has been. So the dispute arises at the initial claim stage and continues right through until uh, the tribunal or until beyond the tribunal. Uh, so individuals will see this as a, as a whole process and not as isolated parts of the process. And the research looking at the experiences of tribunal users and looking at the experiences of individuals seeking to access justice by disputing decisions show that there are a range of barriers that exist <coughs> for individuals in disputing the decision that start with the initial claim and continue right through to the final resolution of the dispute or until uh, the individual drops out of the dispute resolution process. Those uh, barriers can be categorised as intellectual, practical and emotional barriers. Intellectual barriers are, as you might understand, those difficulties that individuals have in understanding how the process works. What is it that the decision maker requires from me? <coughs> what does this claim form mean? I don't understand the language. I don't understand what I must do next. I don't understand how to progress this. Uh, I don't understand what the decision means. So I get a decision, but I'm not sure what that means. I, I understand that I'm not getting what I want, but I don't know why I'm not getting that that decision in my favour uh, and not understanding the basis of that decision. Well, the research is very, very clear that uh, individuals tend to be unaware that there's a legal issue that's in dispute and so they may rehearse the factual issues but not address those factual issues to the legal parameters within which the decision has taken place. Uh, we know that there are forms of support that can help individuals to overcome those intellectual barriers. 
In particular, individualised support is, is, tends to be, uh, the research evidence suggests that it's the most useful. Um, perhaps the, the, uh, the difficulties in providing individualised support make that unrealistic for every user, but nonetheless, that remains the kind of constant way that barriers can be broken down. We tend to use written information much more uh, extensively, and that can be very useful. It can be very helpful where individuals are given written information on the processes that they are going through. But we also know that there are intellectual barriers that are created by that written information, where individuals just don't understand the information that they have. And so the utility of that uh, information is variable. In terms of the practical barriers, uh, they are simply knowing what to do. The individual who knows that they need help and advice but don't know what type of help or advice they need or don't know how to access that, uh, that type of help or advice or try to access that help or advice but there are difficulties in accessing it. Uh, that can be uh, constituted through the difficulties in securing independent evidence to corroborate their claim. It can also uh, manifest itself through the difficulties in accessing legal or specialist support, which leads certainly to the perception, if not the reality, uh, by users that they have a different system, that they are part of a different system. So decision makers have access to a legally assisted process and individual citizens have access to a process that is unassisted uh, and has no particular advice uh, mechanism that they can access. So those are the practical barriers. The emotional barriers relate very much to the fact that for most individuals who dispute a claim, there's a fundamental issue uh, of importance in their lives, and so they're disputing it, and, and it generates uh, particular difficulties for them. But we know as well that the research shows that the dispute resolution process itself generates additional emotional barriers, some of which are very significant, and most of which tend to be negative. So things like uh, users describe or individuals describe uh, feelings of helplessness, anger, stress, nausea, futility, all of those are generated through the dispute resolution process and create another barrier that individuals have to overcome in order to see the dispute through. We know again that individual support can help to alleviate those anxieties and that it has in fact a further positive benefit because it will instill confidence in users to allow them to overcome uh, the barriers and to participate effectively in the decision-making process. The challenge for decision-makers, uh, particularly where there are large volumes of decisions to be made, is to be able to make decisions and deal with disputes in a way that reduces those intellectual, practical and emotional barriers. That's the objective. Uh, it's an objective that needs to be uh, sought, but it's, it's very challenging, and, and I don't <coughs> underestimate for a moment the challenges that exist there. But the premise of, uh, of this presentation, and, and what I hope you'll find is a, is a plausible argument, is that if you can help to overcome those barriers, then you can help to secure greater participation uh, by the individual whose decision is being reviewed, whose case is being reviewed. And if you can secure more trust and more cooperation with that individual citizen, then you potentially produce better information for the decision maker, which will then potentially make a better decision, a more informed, a more accurate decision. And the premise, therefore, is that if you can secure better information, then you can make better decisions. The chances are that the issues that face, face decision makers are going to be most pronounced in the Department for Social Development because welfare reform is putting um, such a strain on decision makers, because the process of welfare reform uh, as we anticipate that it will come through the Welfare Reform Bill, is likely to generate a significant number of appeals where new benefits are brought in, universal credit and personal independence and payments in particular. Um, and that will make it an even more challenging environment in which uh, to make decisions and also to, to dispute decisions. So I'm going to go through where I see the, the pressure points in the system <coughs> existing with a particular focus on decision making in the Department for Social Development, but not exclusive to that, and hopefully the, uh, the, the recommendations that flow from the research evidence will be generic and, and not just apply to social security decision making. The first port of call for any individual who wishes to access entitlement will generally be a, a claim form, an initial claim form. And in order to make a decision from the initial claim form, the decision maker will need good evidence because good decisions need good evidence. There is uh, recent research evidence uh, from uh, Hazel Gann and Cheryl Thomas, which looks at how tribunals make decisions and looks at the difference between an oral hearing and uh, a written hearing. And their research evidence looked at a simulated case of Disability Living Alliance, DLA. Uh, and on the basis that uh, the, 
the individual who challenges a DLA decision is two and a half times more likely to succeed in their appeal if they attend the hearing uh, versus a, a decision made just on the paper. Uh, there is clearly a disparity between the information, the quality of information that's coming through there. And that was reinforced by the fact that when the oral evidence was extracted from uh, the oral hearing and provided as a written supplement to the uh, paper hearing, that the success rate of appeals was broadly similar. So 50% success rate on a supplemented paper hearing versus a 60% success rate on an oral hearing. The conclusion of Gen and Thomas on the basis of the fact that paper hearings were primarily just looking at the information obtained through the DLA claim form was that the uh, claim forms were inadequate because they prevented fair and sound decision making by initial decision makers and consequently therefore by uh, tribunals which heard cases just on the papers. And that's a really you know, big indictment of a system that, se that seeks to get the right information at the outset from the claimant. There's further evidence that, that, uh, that in the initial claim form stage can be problematic, um, that ESA claim forms, uh, for example, are not eliciting the information that's needed by tribunals to make the assessments that are required. Uh, and that's an upper tribunal decision from 2013 where the judge in question bemoaned the paucity of information that was obtained, not just through the ESA claim form, but also through the, I think it's the ESA 85, the medical assessment that's conducted uh, on behalf of the department. So the initial claim forms are not providing decision makers with the information they need. So the first recommendation that flows from that then is to identify the gaps that exist in initial information gathering by mapping the new information that's received through the dispute resolution process against the reasons for overturning the initial decision. If those two elements can be correlated, it's possible that we can see where the deficiencies in the systematic gathering of information are. Looking at the question of evidence, um, the question that arises uh, is, is one of evidential gaps. The issue that arises, rather, is one of evidential gaps, which include those that uh, arise from inadequate claim forms. Uh, where you have decision makers who have the ability to return to uh, appellants or to claimants to ask for further information, the more specific and focused those questions can be, the more useful uh, the information will, that will flow from, the, from those questions. So in other words, rather than just asking a general question of do you have any other information, there is a need to identify the specific evidence that is required and to advise claimants of that specificity. And there's a particular uh, statutory duty that exists here as well because uh, a recent uh, judicial review by the Upper Tribunal uh, in Britain looking at the decision making in the Department for Work and Pensions on Employment and Support Alliance, found that the Secretary of State was in breach of his duty under the Equality Act to make reasonable adjustments uh, for the uh, process, within the process of obtaining further medical evidence for claimants with mental health problems. So it was determined by the Upper Tribunal that the Secretary of State was deficient in this regard and, and was, he was therefore instructed to improve his processes to ensure that persons with mental health problems could provide the information that was required to make an accurate uh, decision on their case. The recommendation, therefore, that comes from that is to try and train decision makers to identify what the evidence gaps are, and therefore to use that information, to use that knowledge to seek specific evidence from claimants to fill that gap. So to, to move away from the general questions of do you have some more information to the specific questions on do you have this type of information on this particular issue that will address this particular problem. The quality of evidence is always going to be key. Uh, we know the decision makers rely often necessarily on certain types of evidence. We know that that is the case even where the research uh, is clear that the quality of the evidence that they rely on is poor. So what we want to see is higher quality evidence because, uh, and adjudications in the, in the tribunals have made this very clear, higher quality evidence will be of higher probative value and evidence that is not of high probative value has been uh, effectively rendered useless. So we need good probative <coughs> evidence from the outset in order for decision makers to make uh, accurate decisions from the outset. We know that claimants will often seek to secure additional corroborative evidence on their own behalf, but there are difficulties for claimants in doing that, which relate to those intellectual and practical barriers in particular. 
Financial barriers can be a problem if you're looking for specialist evidence to support a, a claim on special educational needs provision or on a medical assessment. Uh, that can often cost money, and so there's a financial uh, impediment there. There are also principled objections, uh, often by medical practitioners uh, as a profession. Uh, we know that there are difficulties that the, that the GMC, for example, has expressed uh, extreme reservations about being what they call the gatekeepers to a system that they have no control over. So there are uh, principled objections by medical practitioners that can make it very difficult for individuals to obtain corroborative evidence. So the recommendation that flows from that then is to ensure from the outset that decision makers have access to high quality subject spe specific evidence uh, and that where additional corroborative evidence is required, if claimants are required to, to obtain this, that they will be supported uh, in doing so. The explanation of the decision is part of the decision making process, so it's not enough to just make a good decision, you've got to be able to explain it to the individual who's affected. We know that claimants are, broadly speaking, are often unaware of the assessment criteria for decision making, that they know that they have a particular issue, that they know that there is a general entitlement, but they don't know what the specifics are uh, of, the, of the entitlement criteria. We know also from the research that claimants dispute decisions that they don't understand. This will include meritorious cases, but it will also include hopeless cases that have no prospect of success. Uh, and very often the lack of understanding remains the case and only becomes apparent at the tribunal stage. And in some ways that's the best case scenario that, that, we have, that we currently have, that the tribunal will be the ones who will provide the explanation, the oral explanation, to the individual that this is why your claim has not succeeded, this is the criteria against which your claim is assessed and you don't meet this criteria because X, Y and Z. But that, for that to be the system, that's hopelessly inefficient. It's hopefully, uh, hopelessly inefficient, rather. Uh, and it also distorts the basic principle of natural justice. If you assume that the basic principle of natural justice, or you understand the basic principle of natural justice, being that you have to understand what the decision is in order to understand where your grounds of appeal might lie. If you don't understand what the basic principle of the decision is, or the basis of the decision, then it's not possible to produce an effective appeal from that decision. So the fourth recommendation is to develop improved models of communication which will help claimants understand departmental decisions. And that may often include uh, providing in an accessible format the criteria uh, for the assessment of the claim as part of the explanation of the decision. So in other words, in, in Employment and Support Alliance, for example, rather than saying you're not entitled to this benefit because you don't score 15 points, you have to say to the claimant, your functional limitations are assessed in this way. This limitation will give you this many points. This limitation will give you this many points. And you need 15 points overall. And you've scored this many points because we've assessed uh, on this basis that the, these are the points that you're entitled to. There has to be a way to provide that information to claimants so that they can understand and challenge uh, that assessment uh, effectively. Or that, that, that it, they don't challenge it because the decision is, is a good decision and any appeal is hopeless. The role of the tribunal, uh, perhaps unsur uh, unsurprisingly, I have to focus on the role of the tribunal given that this is a, a, a presentation with justice, but nonetheless, the, the role of the tribunal isn't simply to make right a wrong decision. That's an important function, it has to happen. But there is a further role for tribunal decision making, which is to feed back into the initial decision making process. So decision makers have to understand why initial decisions are being overturned, and this is particularly the case where the success rates are quite considerable. So in ESA, for example, the uh, success rate for ESA appeals sits in and around 40%. And that's a considerable volume of cases that are successfully challenged, which indicates that there are lessons to be learned at the very least, that there are problems somewhere in the system that need to be understood and learned from. Uh, individually, uh, departments can get feedback from tribunals where departmental officers uh, attend the hearing. Now, I know that, uh, that there are some objections to this from other departments who think that it's not enough to just go to the tribunal because you, you're not any the wiser. I'm not sure that I would uh, accept that argument wholesale. I think that if you attend a tribunal hearing, you can understand what it is that the tribunal is seeking to interrogate very specifically, what evidence it seeks to, uh, to flesh out, what points it thinks um, are most important to investigate. And that in itself can be an indication of where priorities lie. Put, putting that together with the tribunal's oral or written <coughs> reasons, to my mind, indicates a better form of understanding the tribunal's decision than not turning up at all. 
systematically, uh, departments can conduct an analysis of the different reasons for tribunals overturning decisions. We see the beginnings of this in the Department for Work and Pensions, uh, working with uh, the uh, Social Entitlement Chamber of the uh, First Tier Tribunal. Um, we need to see more of that. We need to see departments taking that initiative themselves, uh, and we need to see uh, the Department of Justice making sure that that's, that's being done. So that common, and I'll call them for the sake of convenience, common failings in the, in the decision-making process are identified so that either they're not repeated or that they can be more robustly challenged uh, at tribunal. The recommendation that comes from that, therefore, is to identify the best means for decision makers to understand the reasons for tribunal decisions and to ensure that those reasons are then fed back into the decision making process so that this, the cycle is completed. Where I think the Department of Justice has a very specific role is in, in terms of the oversight of the system. Administrative decisions, whether in uh, the Department of Education or the Department of Social Development or any other department, are part of a system of administrative justice. And the Justice Committee and the Justice Department has a responsibility to oversee the workings of the administrative justice system. And in order to do that, there is a need for independent and impartial uh, advice. There's an, uh, an independence that's required from all of the departments uh, that, that will allow systemic problems to be identified. So it's not just problems within one system or one part of the system, but the overview of problems and therefore the solutions that stem from that. And this echoes uh, not just the recommendation in the, uh, or the, the consultation paper on tribunal reform, but the heavy endorsement of, of that proposal in the tribunal reform consultation paper. And that is to establish an independent oversight mechanism for administrative justice in Northern Ireland, looking at this as a wholesale issue, not as an individual aspect where it's judicial oversight of a particular aspect of the judicial system, but a system that works for individual users from start to finish. The conclusions, therefore, uh, are unsurprising that there are significant challenges that are faced by decision makers, uh, but there are also very significant challenges faced by those who wish to dispute decisions. Many will not be able to dispute decisions, so they won't even make it to the tribunal. They won't make it past that first point of getting a decision that goes against them. We know that poor decision making uh, can necessitate challenges. We also know that poor decision making will block progress in resolving disputes. We know that new legislative schemes will generate increased challenges and increased pressures on decision makers, but there is no area of administrative justice that is problem free, so it's not just that we need to get over this next uh, hurdle of welfare reform, there will always be difficulties there. I think that it's possible to improve on what we've got, and I think if we look at it as a question of decision making and focus on four main areas, then we might be able to do that. If we look at evidence on which the initial decisions are based, if we look at the communications with claimants, we look at the understanding of why decisions are overturned and we look at oversight of systemic problems. I think that can lead to better decision making and that in turn can improve access to justice.